the whole story of biofilms really got to start from uh, corruption in the academe, the groves of academe, because uh, I needed a way to put climbing expenses on my grant. <laughs> And the only system I could think of that had any microbiology associated with it was the, uh, the alpine streams that banged down over these rocks. And uh, there was a very tantalizing piece of information. In fact, the answer popped right out in the biofilm question in the very first time we looked at this system. Because if you look at the microbiological population of the stream, you'll find eight bacteria per mill, possibly 12 bacteria per mill. Same in the Montana Alpine streams. But if you uh, look at the wet rocks on the side of the stream, you'll five find five times 10 to the eighth bacteria per centimeter squared. And if you're walking home and uh, step on one of these things and don't distribute your weight, perf weight perfectly, uh, the biofilms will get you. So, so basically, uh, the system, total, almost a pure culture of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, very common organism in our hospital environments. This is where it has lived long before we evolved. And it does this and lives on the, on the rocks alongside of the stream for one particular reason. Uh, biofilms, which it forms very, very uh, instinctively and naturally, are its way of surviving UV and surviving drying. So think about this in the hospital environment. Pseudomonas has been around for a very long time. Its strategy, long before we came along, was to get out on the surface, cover itself with a slimy material. We've got to think of a euphemism for slime, don't we? And we can't keep it. If anybody can think of a euphemism for slime, uh, it'd be great. Uh, and this is what the bacteria do. They grow out onto surfaces, cover themselves with huge amounts of this polysaccharide material, grow in the slimy mass, and survive drying for very long periods of time survive UV, and therefore that's their native behavior in their native habitat. So if we, uh, if we actually take a, a surface, uh, we took methacrylate plates, Gilgisi and I, and put them in this alpine stream for as little as uh, 15 minutes, you'll get a monolayer of pseudomonas. They'll cover themselves in this polysaccharide. These are clay platelets from the glaciers up top. And you'll have a monolayer in 15 minutes, and you'll have five times 10 to the eighth population in about four days. So uh, this is the intriguing thing this about Pseudomonas in the natural environments. What it does is gets itself onto a surface. It makes a biofilm, which is 15% cells and 85% polysaccharide matrix, and just sit back, sits back and traps nutrients. Now, if you're thinking about a distilled water line in a lab, or a fairly pure water system in a hospital, what the bacteria are then doing is getting onto a surface somewhere in your piping, pulling what little nutrient there is in the water for their nutrition, growing in lovely little communities, sustaining themselves particularly well, and shedding occasional bacteria. And that's why in a new building sometime you'll have a distilled water system. You turn on the tap uh, for your first set of experiments and slime comes out of the tap. How did that happen? There's almost no nutrient around. But this is the way the bacteria do it. They extract the nutrients from the passing water so that, in fact, you can add up the nutritional content of thousands of liters as they went by, and that sustains the bacterial population that we're talking about today. So that's the biofilm idea. The uh, idea is fairly uh, encapsulated in this shot from Cam Wyndham. Cam's now in Ottawa. He was working on a river system for me. And uh, we should have actually gone further with this picture when we first had it. This is the bacterium has just settled on a surface. It spun out a fairly large amount of this polysaccharide material and then divided to make two and then divided to make four and then divided to make eight and then made 16. And what it was trying to tell us is we're really happy on this surface, right? <laughs> we are reproducing, we're comfortable, and uh, now, about 14 years after this picture was taken, we realized that the natural state, the happy state of bacteria in any system, is on a surface in a biofilm. Now, thinking about such things as Legionella in a hospital ventilation system, for example, uh, organisms can be there. If you have condensate water anywhere in the system, you'll find them swimming around in certain numbers. And you'll find about a thousand times that number on a surface somewhere an intermittently wet surface somewhere. They'll be in a biofilm 
85% polysaccharide, 15% cells. And if you blow hard enough in the air conditioning system, you'll actually blow pieces of that biofilm out. And if you aim them directly at patients, they'll get Legionnaire's disease. So it's, a, it's a, a, just a natural extension. This is the way they grow in streams. This is the way they grow in lakes. And we'll try and make this uh, point in a medical context as we go. Well, the biofilm idea was fairly uh, thoroughly hatched in Scientific American in 1978. And uh, it was quite interesting because you know how things work in the medical field. Um, quite different from the scientific fields. If the chief has an idea, then all the residents have the same idea and all the interns have the same idea. It's a little bit more regimented than the systems that uh, we're used to. And Alan Ronald in uh, Winnipeg had an idea that possibly biofilms had something to do with chronic disease. And so therefore, uh, Tom Mary down in Halifax now, who was a resident in Allen's system, had the same idea as his boss, but he really didn't believe it. And so he had a patient, and this patient uh, did a lot of good things for us. The patient's name was also Tom, and uh, he, <coughs> he had a severe alcohol problem and lived on a cardboard box at the docks in Halifax. He's a great guy, and uh, fell down, hurt his elbow. Uh, got a bacteremia with Staphylococcus aureus and uh, was all a real sick bunny and came into the hospital. And Tom noticed that he had a bulge in this area just in here, and it was the battery for a pacemaker. But the pacemaker battery had long since died and he wasn't pacing anymore. And so we had a bacteremia in a patient and we had a foreign device. We had a foreign material in the same patient. So we asked Tom if it was okay, Tom the patient, if it was okay if we just found out how much cloxacillin he could tolerate. So we gave him 14 grams a day of cloxacillin, which is quite a lot. <laughs> and uh, we, he was a volunteer in this whole thing, so he let himself out and went drinking each night. So it was cloxacillin plus alcohol for, for three weeks. <laughs> the alcohol was taken by the traditional route. I'm not sure if it sterilized anything or not. <laughs> so he was, uh, it was really quite fun because after three weeks of, uh, of this regime of cloxacillin and alcohol, uh, after a couple of days, his fever went right down. He was having a great time. He kind of enjoyed all the attention and a nice dry place to sleep. And uh, after three weeks, and we took him off the cloxacillin, back came exactly the same Staph aureus strain, typed out exactly the same way, same fever, same symptoms. And this is the, the medical experience, basically, is that if you have a device and the device is at all involved in the infection, and this had to be, it was endocardial, and he had a bacteremia. Then, of course, it'll just keep coming back until you do something about it. So the intriguing thing was we put him on another three weeks of cloxacillin, this time with some rifampicin, just to be absolutely sure, really clobbered him for another three weeks, took him off at the end of six weeks, and right back into the bacteremia again. So we took the pacemaker out, and uh, it was quite a moment of true, sort of a white Walt Kelly moment for us. This is the metal here, this is the plastic, this is the old-fashioned endocardial pacemaker. Now this crud was all around the outside here. And after we rinsed the pacemaker and scraped it off and plated it, a tenth of the eighth the living bacteria off the end of this thing. And here's the end of the Walt Kelly moment. This is the back biofilm of Staphylococcus aureus that we were trying to treat in this particular patient. Here are the cells, here's the slime they're embedded in. This technique actually dries the cells down so you don't see the matrix very well, but you can see the remnant of the matrix down here. And quite clearly, you know, you're really beating on a biofilm like this with huge doses of antibiotic, and it's just not going to get killed. And that would take the device out. And this is now general conventional medical wisdom. If you have a device and the device is part of an infection, it has to be removed before the infection can be cured. But we couldn't uh, take an anecdotal approach all the way, so uh, what we did was to generate some numbers. We didn't end up using artificial urine, we used real urine, professorial and graduate student urine. Cool. <laughs> Technician urine was toxic, we're not quite sure why, uh, particularly on Mondays. And uh, <laughs> so we got real urine. And then, uh, not facetiously, we got real bacteria. We decided not to use the strains that have been kicking around in the lab for 1,500 transfers and used in so many experiments. Went straight to the clinical lab, got some bacteria right by the recall. I got the right back out of a, 
uh, no, sorry, they were suits actually, got them right back out of a catheter-related infection, and then ran them down through this device uh, past uh, latex, catheter latex, and made ourselves a biofilm. It's really easy to do. Uh, here are the bacteria clustered on the surface after just two hours of the bacteria and urine going by. Uh, here we are after eight hours. You can't even see the latex anymore. If you ever are dealing with patients and, and you see a catheter, most of the catheters are milky and cloudy. If you ever get a clear one, and there's two kinds that are clear, you can actually see this layer of biofilm going up the catheter wall towards the patient's bladder. We call it the creeping crud. And it's, uh, first of all, it's fairly clear and it gets a little bit milky as it starts to trap some crystals and so on. And it actually moves along the surface up into the person's bladder. And that's why we have, of course, such a problem with urinary catheter-associated infections. Here's the biofilm that we produced. And uh, what we did was to take these cells, they're pseudomonas, we went after them with tobermycin. And we had swimming cells in a test tube environment, and we hit them with 50 micrograms per mil of tobermycin, contact time of eight hours, and kill them completely. But if we had the biofilm on the surface that we produced in the way that I just described, and we hit it with a thousand micrograms per mil, contact time of 12 hours, no really significant kill. And so basically what it was telling us was that biofilms are fantastically resistant to antibiotics. And the reason that we're all gathered here today is they're also fantastically resistant to steroids. So that if you have any antibacterial agent, the rule of thumb now is that for every unit it takes to kill a planktonic organism, it takes a thousand times as much to kill a biofilm organism. And so this is the target that we have. Now, just a cartoon to nail this down. If you have a patient like this and they have a foreign body device in them in some way, you usually recover the bacteria from fluids, so you usually grow them up planktonically in the lab, and that's your MIC and MBC, a planktonic killing dose for the MBC. It'll have a certain value. Then we take the organisms and grow them on a surface like this and make a biofilm like this and get the biofilm killing dose. This can now be done with a kit that's being sold out of Calgary, and the biofilm killing dose will be between 1,000 and 1,500 times as high as the planktonic killing dose. So whenever you're doing a test to see uh, how a sterilant is working or how an antibiotic is working, if you grow them up as planktonic cells, then you get an answer. And that answer is, how much does it take to kill a floating cell? Now, in a medical context, that's really quite a useful answer because in the case of Tom, the guy down on the docks, right, it was the planktonic bacteria were giving him his fever. It wasn't the biofilm on his pacemaker. So you can quiet down a patient's symptoms by giving them the planktonic killing dose. And that'll be just fine. They'll feel quite a bit better. But you didn't kill the biofilm. The biofilm will start shedding new planktonic bacteria. And this is the explanation for why chronic diseases seem to come back and come back and come back. They don't actually come back. They never go away. The biofilm is always there, quietly being the reservoir, shedding new planktonic bacteria. And this makes sense in a great many different infections that we uh, deal with all the time in the medical context. Am I making this point at all clearly? Is this, is this okay? Uh, you know, if you want to think about biofilms, think about plaque on your teeth, which is a classic biofilm. Not the easy stuff to get off, but the stuff where the dentist almost kills you with that little vibrating thing, right? The hard plaque. Or if you keep tropical fish, think of the slime that develops on the glass plates and those kinds of things. That's the consistency of this material, this biofilm. It's very hard to kill and just keeps coming back and back at you all the time. So I don't want to uh, be scornful of the answers that you get from this because this is what it takes to, to actually shut down the acute phase of any infection, and this is what it takes to shut down the biofilm. Now, is this answer at all useful in a clinical context or in any kind of a context? Yes, it is, uh, because some orthopedic surgeons now, if a hip gets infected, will go directly into the synovial space with huge doses of antibiotics, have a drain out the far side, and they can't prove it, of course, because you can't go in and scrape stuff. But it looks like they're shutting down some orthopedic infections in this way. And in sterilization, we do it all the time. We kill biofilms by just huge, sustained doses of effective biocides. But the critical thing is that when we're testing, 
and making sure that we have actually killed, we have to look at the biofilm death and not just the death of the planktonic cells. Yes? So are, the, are manufacturers of companies who make sterilants or sterilizers, are they developing tests to um, prove efficacy against biofilm? We actually do a whole bunch of testing in our center for people who are developing sterilants of various kinds, including the gas sterilizers and all of these sterilizers. And the key is that you actually preform a biofilm and stick it in there, as well as the spore test and the standard test. Make sure you kill the biofilm as well as killing the planktonic cells. And what they'll get if they don't do this, and what they used to get in the old days, was these anomalies, you know? The spore test would be negative, the bacterial test would be negative, but you keep getting an occasional incident where uh, an infection could be traced back to the biofilm. And in fact, those are what we're now systematizing by putting biofilms into the test system and making sure that they're killed. Heat's pretty effective in sterilizing biofilms. Oxidizing agents are pretty effective. Anything that comes down and oxidizes, and here we're talking you know, hydrogen peroxide and things like bleach, will actually dissolve away the polysaccharide matrix. They'll kill the bacteria, and they'll come right down to the surface relentlessly and eat their way through a biofilm pretty effectively. I think I probably was responsible, I've got you, I was responsible for the largest order of bleach that there's ever been on the planet because I, I was doing a consulting job in the oil business and I had a deaerator tower 180 feet high and 30 feet across. And when we opened the manholes on it, it was absolutely full of biofilm, 180 feet high. So we got a barge of bleach from Singapore at 15% and we just cycled 15% bleach through this tower. Uh, the stainless steel held up pretty well <laughs> under the circumstances, and we just dissolved the bleach out of this big tower. We do it in the oil business all the time. Uh, we use, you know, we don't fool around in the oil business, 15% bleach, which you can't use, of course, in many circumstances. You're going to destroy things, but it's very, very effective. So am I sort of making the point here? The biofilm is particularly susceptible to oxidizing biocides because you're actually dissolving away the matrix and exposing the bacteria as you go down uses up quite a bit of bleach in the process, but it's particularly effective. Because we've actually looked for Olympus at um, sterilizing their colonoscopes because they've got that biopsy channel down the middle of them, that of course is your real bomb. And we have an electrical method where we can actually put a DC field across these things and have the biocides work particularly well. Glutaraldehyde is really a tanning agent. It was used for tanning hides long before it was used as a sterilant. It gets used up in the matrix material, it gets locked into the matrix material, and so you get pickled biofilm as it gradually comes down through. It gets used up as it goes, and it's not really very effective against biofilms. You can actually see it work. Now, we have a, a we'll show you some pictures of this later on, but we have a, a way we can look at a live biofilm and do a test of who's alive and who's dead in there. And if you put in glutaraldehyde, you can just see the glutaraldehyde slowly working from the outside, killing a few of the outside organisms. It takes an awful lot of glutaraldehyde to get down to the last organism in the system. And if you don't kill all of the bacteria in a biofilm and then you take away the sterilant, then of course the survivors wake up in the guts of their neighbors, right, who just died, and they divide every 20 minutes. They'll go right back to a full biofilm four hours. So if you don't kill a biofilm completely, the survivors do wonderfully because they're in a perfect nutrient environment. So glute's never been particularly good for us. Uh, we worked in the porcine heart valve business, a fairly large amount, and they sterilized with glutaraldehyde and work in baths with one and a half percent glutaraldehyde, breathing the fumes and the whole business. And it is unsatisfactory, and Mycobacterium kalani kalani kept up, became resistant, grew in biofilms, and gave us fits. So it hasn't been very effective for us. The biggest thing, rather than eating your way down through the layer chemically, just remove the layer, right? So very meticulous cleaning is obviously the key thing. And then the U.S. Navy did us a great favor because they were looking at cleaning their ships and they would scrub and uh, clean all the outside of the ships. And then there was this slimy layer left, not many bacteria left, and it refouled at 10 times the rate of a clean steel plate. And they just get a little whiff. They use bleach, but any oxidizing biocide will do. Took it right down to clean and then it refouled at the clean rate. So not only are you cleaning better, but your refouling rate is much, much more favorable. And leaving pickled or natural biofilm matrix on a surface just invites a new biofilm back onto the surface. We really should take it off mechanically as best we can and then oxidize it right down and get it clean. That's the best way. Are there any surface materials that are more prone to biofilm attack? 
attachment than any others? That's a gorgeous question, and that is literally a, a hundred billion dollar question. <laughs> The companies were looking for uh, a biofilm proof material. Just imagine what they could charge for heart valves or something like that. And so what we uh, ended up doing and, and did a, a great deal of this was we would test their quote biofilm resistant materials. And the problem was bad microbiology because what they'd do is they'd take a strain that had been transferred thousands of times in the lab, could barely hang on by its fingernails anyway, and then produce some material like Teflon modified or silver modified where that lab bug wouldn't stick. And then they'd try to extrapolate it into patients and immediately everything stuck everywhere. So we got to the use of wild bacteria. And wild bacteria are ones that haven't been in a test tube for a long period of time. You can live in a test tube, you've got no challenge, right? There's nobody after you in a test tube. You can lose all your outside layers, grow real fast, live dangerously. Uh, take cocaine, do whatever you're going to do, and, <laughs> and nothing's going to hurt you in the test tube, right? But the moment you get back into nature again, you're dead meat. So all we did out in Calgary was for $5,200 Canadian, we would take anybody's material that they'd spent one and a half million dollars developing, in the case of DuPont, their biofilm proof material, put it in with urine and wild bugs. And uh, I've heard a vice president cry over the phone, because wild bugs and natural urine will eat your lunch. I mean, they're, they're all over his stuff. It was worse than red rubber latex. This was the stuff they were going to build catheters out of. But it's our fault, not their fault. I mean, these people are trained mostly as engineers, and the microbiology just isn't right, is it? I mean, if, you, if we take crippled strains and do our research with crippled strains, we're, we're at fault. And so if you take wild bugs and natural fluids, then you can actually test pretty realistically. But Mario, I like your point very, very much about the glutaraldehyde. Anything that, we use glute a great deal in the oil business, tremendous amount in the oil business. And it does quite well for us because we combine it with mechanical cleaning. We'll take a line, badly contaminated, run a great big three-ton pig down a 60-inch line, and then a whole slug of glutaraldehyde followed by another pig. And that way we take off the pickled dead biofilm, scrape it off, and it works real well, and glutaraldehyde doesn't bother the metal whereas oxidizing things do bother the metal. And in that way, if you use it that way, it works. Nobody ever said glutaraldehyde didn't kill planktonic bacteria. It kills planktonic bacteria beautifully, like most of the sterilants do. But the question is, does it kill biofilms? Yes, it does, slowly, by pickling and tanning its way down. Whereas oxidizing agents actually etch away, the biofilms actually removed, and you expose more cells and kill them as you go. So this is the uh, image that probably is best to keep in mind. A biofilm is made of uh, lots of slime, a few bacteria embedded in it. And when you're coming in with a sterilant, particularly an oxidizing sterilant, you're slowly eating your way down, killing the bacteria as you go. If they get down to the bottom and you kill all the bacteria in a biofilm, you're fine. If you leave any alive, you're really in trouble, and I think we understand why. Okay, now uh, just a couple of other things, and not much emphasis in here. Uh, we often wondered why chronic infections wouldn't clear themselves, and here we are interested in cystic fibrosis. Uh, here are the pseudomonas growing in cystic fibrosis in the alveolus of a lung. Here's the polysaccharide, somewhat condensed by this method, and this crust around the outside here. We wonder what it was for several weeks, and then we stain for IgG, and it's actually immune complexes or antibodies, antigens reacted in a total crust around the outside about half a micron thick, and yet these cells, even the ones right out next to the antibody uh, crust, are still alive. So in fact, antibodies just don't kill biofilm bacteria at all. So this is why if you have osteomyelitis, cystic fibrosis, prostatitis, or middle ear infections, uh, which are all biofilm type infections, you can have very high levels of circulating antibodies, and they react perfectly with the antigens but they don't bother biofilm bacteria at all. This tragic tale that goes with this one, Jim Pennington uh, from uh, Women's and, and uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital down in Boston uh, decided against a whole bunch of advice that he would immunize kids with cystic fibrosis with uh, LPS-based ba vaccines against pseudomonas. They were infected with pseudomonas. It's classical wisdom that you should, in fact, you know, get lots of antibodies against the infecting organism. He uh, had uh, four in the treatment group and three in the control group, and all four in the treatment group were dead in four months. 
what he had actually done was to raise their antibody levels uh, to a point where there was tremendous immune complex reaction around these slime balls in their lungs like this. And uh, then he refused to write up the paper for the literature. But I think everybody now understands it because we've now got some of these patients on prednisone actually suppressing their immune response so they don't make too many antibodies against the infecting organism because they don't work. And whenever you get an immune complex disease like this, for reasons I'll show you later, you get a lot of damage. So, so basically, antibodies don't work against biofilm. Antibiotics don't work about bi against biofilms. And uh, this is one that I've been putting back into my lectures in celebration of my daughter-in-law. Uh, when you get to a certain age and you believe in nepotism as I do, your kids work in your lab. And they get romantically involved with your graduate students. So my son married my postdoc. <laughs> so she's now my favorite daughter-in-law from being my favorite postdoc. And this is Kathy's experiment. And one of the reasons is celebrating is that she just presented us with twins, which is fabulous. <laughs> my son has cystic fibrosis, and there was a lot of engineering went into the twins. <laughs> and we're all very triumphant in the family right now. But this is Kathy's experiment, and I think it's an elegant one. Uh, she invented this lifesaver device. Uh, this is a Teflon rod with Teflon discs and some silastic just on the edges of it. And she just got a biofilm started. She only had about ooh, 10 to the 3 bacteria per centimeter squared, just a few little cells, a little tiny bit of slime covering them, little teardroppy things, and put them in the peritoneum of a rabbit. Now, the peritoneum is very well defended by phagocytes of all kinds. And so we were expecting that this thing would get cleaned up by the white cells when it went into the peritoneum. And these red dots show the progression of the biofilm went right up to almost 10 to the 8th on these discs in the peritoneum of the rabbit, even from a very humble start. So what this means is that a little teardrop-shaped blob like this with three bacteria in it is totally phagocyte-proof when you put it in as a foreign body into the peritoneum. And then what she did, I thought it was brilliant, she immunized the rabbits against the same strain that she was using to build the biofilm, and for some weird reason, the biofilm did slightly better in the presence of opsonizing antibodies. So basically, uh, biofilms are real resistant to antibiotics, as we said, antibodies, as we said, and also phagocytosis. Here we're looking down on top of a biofilm. It's cracked because of the preparative methods. And these are the white cells going crazy across the surface. And they can sniff that there's something foreign there. They sniff that they're supposed to be going in there and killing these bacteria. They know they're there, but they can't get at them. And this is because of the polysaccharide matrix. So what they tend to do, as uh, shown here, this is from a review in Science last year. Uh, if you have planktonic bacteria, they're killed by <laughs> antibiotics, by antibodies, and they're picked up by white cells. If they get a chance to form a biofilm, which they do preferentially on a foreign material like this, they become antibiotic-proof, antibody-proof, and absolutely phagocyte-proof. What happens as the biofilm develops more and more is that the white cells will come along, and when they can't pick up the bacteria in the biofilm, but they know they're there, they fire degradative enzymes, shown here in red, indiscriminately into the surrounding tissue. If you get into a really bad state where they get really excited and there's lots of antibodies on the surface of the biofilm like this and they know they're supposed to be digesting something, they sit back and fire enzymes that don't have any effect on the biofilm at all, but they kill the surrounding tissue. This is why if you have an infected prosthesis like a, a plate or a set of screws or even a whole hip, it starts to loosen quite quickly because the white cells are actually firing enzymes out and destroying a great deal of the tissue. Also why we're immune suppressing um, CF kids, and here in Kingston, Kurt Nickel is also immune suppressing some prostatitis patients because the prostate just gets so irritated and so inflamed that it's doing a great deal of medical damage, and so they sort of quiet the whole thing down as best they can. And here's the kicker on this thing. Uh, these biofilm infections in this pattern had been slowly building up, mostly in compromised people and diabetic cystic fibrosis kids, uh, youngsters who are going to daycare and having a lot of contact with other people, picking up middle ear infections, so that now the figure out of the CDC is 65% of the infectious problems seen by doctors in the developed world 
are biofilm infections. Now we've got rid of a whole bunch of the planktonic infections because they were well treated by antibiotics and by vaccines and so on. But 65% of what people are seeing now, these would be the junky infections in diabetes where you've got a diabetic foot or something like it, middle ear infections in kids, which is huge. Any osteo, any device-related stuff. If, for example, a person has a catheter, like a vascular catheter going in, and you get an exit site infection around that catheter, that's a pure biofilm. And if you can get enough vancomycin to it, you can overpower the biofilm sometime, but only temporarily. You usually have to take the device out before you can cure the patient. So this is the, the sort of summary of the first part of my talk. And uh, let's kick this around a little bit and see uh, what makes sense and what doesn't make sense at this point. The old infections we had, diphtheria, we had scarlet fever, all caused by planktonic bacteria. Antibiotics worked, vaccines worked. Those diseases we don't see that much anymore. What we see now is uh, you get a diabetic uh, person having various infections, hard to cure, device-related infections, hard to cure, osteo. Middle ear is a big one. And we've now got a big NIH grant to look at middle ear infections. And as we looked at the Haemophilus out of the middle ear, we took some tubes out, and you can actually hold the tube up, and a big blob falls off the bottom of the tube. And that's what you're actually fighting against in a middle ear infection. How are we doing? Make a certain amount of Carol? Now, has the biofilm always been around, or is this something that... Well, biofilms have always been there. Uh, the key thing was that uh, they were sort of a minor thing. You know, if you got diphtheria or scarlet fever or something, you got a pretty acute infection. Uh, the biofilms were always there. Compromised people didn't live for long periods of time. We didn't have CF kids living into their 40s or anything like that. Uh, people with diabetic infections often succumbed to those infections pretty early on. So keeping people going a lot longer than we ever used to. And uh, think about an endotracheal tube. Are you guys all in the hospital environment? You are, aren't you? Endotracheal tube straight down, right? Think about that cuff around the endotracheal tube. And uh, that endotrache's going to have to come out if the person survives, right? So you vacuum around the cuff as best you can, take the endotracheal tube out, put a whole bunch of biofilm once on top of that cuff. It's going to head down into the lungs, okay? White cells aren't working. Antibodies aren't working. So we do this with animals right now, and we can actually show that parts of the lung just fibrose off. So, Carol, to take your point, and really reinforces my point, is that the old days you were pretty healthy and you got an acute infection and you survived and you didn't survive. Now a lot, many, a lot more people surviving, often in a compromised state. The biofilms were always there in nature. Pseudomonas was always making them in water systems. Legionella was making them in lakes. The sort of scummy algal bits around the side of the lakes are full of Legionella. So the environmental organisms are quietly coming into the hospital into the bodies, and they lived in biofilms in nature, and they live in biofilms in us. And that's why we don't have these fire-breathing pathogens anymore, like diphtheria and so on. We have just pseudomonas, and pseudomonas is just an ordinary environmental bug. It's a, there's more pseudomonas on a bunch of wilting flowers in a patient's room. Than, I mean, they're all over the place. <laughs> they're just an environmental bug. For a very brief length of time, uh, pseudomonas was actually used in the First World War uh, to displace uh, anaerobes and gangrene uh, prone uh, serious multiple fractures. People actually used Pseudomonas therapeutically because it was an environmental organism and not a pathogen. Until the late 1930s it was never a pathogen, it was always an environmental bug. So what have we got kicking around now? We've got uh, all kinds of the alkaligenes type organisms, we've got a lot of uh, strange strains of strep, which are just skin organisms, we've got a lot of staph, we've got SUDs, and we've got serratia, which is another very environmental organism. And we don't have the fire-breeding pathogens anymore. We just have environmental organisms invading our systems. And they use biofilms as their primary tactic. I kind of took off answering your question. Did I answer your question? Yes. <laughs> you just didn't recognize them really before. They didn't have the same host. They didn't have this. Yeah, yeah, they weren't a medical problem, really. Um, but I guess, you know, we've always had plaque in our teeth and scum in our aquariums. And <laughs> yes. But the advent of antibiotics also has probably shifted the balance, right? I think it has. Uh, but, you know, yes, 
that they, the uh, advent of antibiotics left biofilms, of course, growing in all of these environments. But they probably were growing as biofilms even before this case. Uh, it's just a sort of a natural progression as we solve certain problems. The bacteria had an ace up their sleeve, if they have sleeves, and the ace up their sleeve was the biofilm. And now when they sit back at the CDC and sort of look at what kind of infections are coming to practitioners, they're mostly this kind of infection. Because after all, antibiotics work and vaccines work and most of the other diseases are wiped out now. How are we doing for... We're going to get back in the medical context in the second half of the next section. <laughs> so let's uh, now take off and, and look at some of the things that have been happening in the biofilm field. The... Uh, I find it particularly intriguing that in 1990, the Center for Biofilm Engineering was put in at Montana State. Bill Chiraklis was the first director. He died in 92, and I took over in 93. And it wasn't the medical part of the U.S. or the uh, microbiology part of the U.S. that actually funded this. It was the engineering directorate, which I find very significant indeed, because engineers like to identify and solve practical problems. Uh, so what they did was they uh, voted this to be one of the major problems in computer manufacture, in the oil industry, and in cooling systems. Really serious problems. And the engineers didn't know how to solve these problems at all, uh, but they had this very systematic approach. And so what they actually voted, and uh, this is a kind of an intriguing thing between the countries, they voted $22 million over 11 years as a base a grant. I don't like to talk about the money situation, but, but basically the NSF uh, funded and industry then came in reinforced and NIH is coming in now and the state came in up to about a $5 million a year level, but it was a concerted approach. It was you know, not just have some microbiologists working on it, some clinicians working on it and that type of thing, but they wanted to have a whole organized approach to the problem. The problem was very serious. I mean, matters of corrosion alone will hit it seven or eight billion dollars in the country in one year. And what it eventually did was to bring together this kind of a group. It's unique in the world. Uh, graduate students are the most important pis people in any uh, kind of a system. There's 51 in the center, and only eight are microbiologists. Uh, some of them are mathematicians because we do a lot of modeling, but virtually the vast majority are different kinds of engineers. Now, this is a really intriguing approach because uh, this, this will give you all the weapons of engineers, engineering to bear on a particular problem. And engineers just don't subscribe to a whole bunch of the nonsense that microbiologists subscribe to. Uh, I failed high school math, uh, and that's why I'm a microbiologist. I'm an associate dean of engineering right now, and I think I'm the only associate dean of engineering in the world who failed high school math. I'm pretty sure I am. <laughs> So ba basically, you needed to get people who were organized and people who could understand the math and people who could understand the techniques going on what has always been a microbiological problem. Because we weren't, as microbiologists, doing so good. In fact, needed a lot of help. So this is the, uh, this is the sequence. It's kind of fun, incidentally. Also, in engineering, there are uh, probably 5% female students in the engineering college, but there's almost half uh, people of the female persuasion, and almost all of our PhD students are women. So basically, this is the unit. Uh, they're all uh, mixed in one area from 11 different departments, and they actually are in carrels with adjoining desks in the offices. So you have a computer person next to a chemical engineer, next to a chemist, next to a microbiologist, and we're training people that have never been trained this way before. So crossover in the training is fantastic. And I'll just sort of show you some of the things that the engineers did some of them before I came to the center uh, that I think were pivotal. Here we have a, a biofilm seen by confocal sc scanning laser microscopy. The confocal scope, which uses a laser to form the image, can look at a living biofilm on an opaque surface. So you can look at a biofilm on steel or any plastic surface of any kind. <laughs> and this was the real clincher. We couldn't, stop, we couldn't keep on doing electron microscopy because you have to kick the specimens around so badly. So this is, in fact, a living biofilm. 
This cell could be just leaving, another one could be just coming in. And you can look at them in the XY axis or in the XZ axis, XZ axis, like this. So you take the image and roll it over whichever way you want. Uh, build a block. You could even diagonally uh, audition the image in any way you want. And this was the first major discovery in biofilms in the 90s was that biofilm cells are in these slime towers like this with a matrix around them, but there are huge water channels running down through the biofilm. Of course, we never saw them on the electron scope because everything's dried out and collapsed. So this was the, uh, uh, the beginning of the study of biofilms. And uh, I'll go back to this point and really beat on it. Here's a tower made of slime with a gold-colored bacteria inside. Here's a cell just leaving. Here's a mushroom-shaped tower like this. Biofilms have shape. So each cell has its own position. It builds the matrix in a particular way. As we began to see this, we began to see that the biofilm was a lot more sophisticated than we thought. You know, the mushroom we continuously talk about, here's the stalk of a mushroom, here's the head of a mushroom, here are water channels all the way through over here. This is not a random structure. This is a very highly organized structure. So uh, the thing that has intrigued us a lot, now we're looking down on the top of a biofilm. This is a mushroom coming up towards us. This is a huge mushroom over here. And these are deep canyons and there's water flow. These are polystyrene beads down here. And if I had, in fact, been able to transfer this file to my hard drive, you would have seen the animation on this. Uh, these are polystyrene beads that are flowing very quickly down through a primitive circulatory system. Another shallow water channel here and a blind-ended water channel here. So in essence, you have like a, sort of like a garden you know, with a bush here and a low set of flowers here and circulation going on down, here, down around them. And of course, we always wondered how the bacteria in the bottom of a biofilm could get any nutrition or could get rid of their waste. And they actually have a primitive circulatory system, which is kind of cool. So this was uh, discovered by the engineers. And uh, the thing that reassures me is that when you go to a real system, this is the river where the river runs through it, was filmed just outside of Bozeman. <laughs> Looking down on top of it here, uh, here are aggregates slimy aggregates. Here you can see the different kinds of bacterial cells, and here you can see the water channels. And here an amoeba has actually found a water channel, and it's going down the water channel, trapping any loose bugs it can find and eating them. And if they're in a biofilm, it can't touch them and sort of polish the outside of each microcolony of bacteria. We watched this thing for about four hours. I forgot to go home. <laughs> so we're reassured here because it's a natural biofilm. It's a real biofilm and this is the way they really work. And I guess they're not going to worry about white cells very much, eh? because long before animals evolved, uh, multicellular animals evolved, here was amoeba, and amoeba was nibbling at them since probably about a couple hundred million years ago, and they solved that problem a long time ago. So this is how a biofilm actually grows, and they, um, Our star engineer is Zbigniew Lewandowski from the Polish National Academy. We just stole him. He's now got these things down to eight microns on the tips. And engineers have a very, very intriguing mindset. You know the microbiological concept of most probable number, MPN? You want to you say that to an engineer sometime, and they get really quite excited because I mean, they're used to real numbers, very definite numbers. Most probable number is offensive to them. It's deeply offensive to them. <laughs> so they said, why don't you just take a microscope and go and count the damn things, right? No, just no, not most probable number, but real number. And it's the mindset of the engineers that is so valuable. So what Zbigniew wanted to do is, uh, we were speculating about whether or not oxygen was getting to the bottom of a biofilm. So he just took this probe. He could make a probe for anything. He could make it for chlorine or chloride or anything. And he came down uh, under the confocal scope on a sort of a ratchet device, taking measurements as he, w as he went down through a mushroom like this. And he solved a long-standing microbiological mystery, because in the middle of the heads of these mushrooms, in a perfectly aerobic environment, sitting in air, fairly thin biofilm, single mushroom superimposed like that, it's totally anaerobic in the head of that mushroom. 
Now, I always wondered when we were doing skin microbiology and you swab somebody's skin, you'd pick up about 70% anaerobes, right? What, the, what are anaerobes doing on the human skin? Uh, how can anaerobes possibly live in aerobic environments? Well, the middle of every mushroom head is absolutely anaerobic as old socks. So, now, you got an antibiotic, right? And it might work really well against aerobes, but not at all against anaerobes. Well, okay. Uh, Pseudomonas growing as an anaerobe, which it can do because it's facultative, isn't going to be susceptible to that particular antibiotic or the other way around or whatever you like. So every biofilm is a mixture of bacteria growing in every physiological state that you can possibly imagine. So, um, this is the, again, when I I've got to figure out how to transfer my files on my hard drive without losing my animation. So this is now a, you know, one of those books that they used to, you're probably all too young to know this, but you used to be able to take a book and flip the pages and you got a movie as you went along. <laughs> this is a summary of how it works. Uh, bacteria come down onto a surface. We can watch them on the confocal scope. Turns out that they rearrange themselves after they get onto a surface, make little stacks here and there. Then they change genetically, and I'll prove that to you later. Start making the slime. Build a tower like this. There are water channels left in this mass. 85% matrix, 15% cells. Gradually build higher and higher towers. And that's your biofilm sequence. To give you an idea of how long this takes, uh, pseudomonas will get to be about 25 microns high if you give it six hours on a surface. So biofilm can form fairly quickly. And you can actually see the biofilms under this uh, wonderful new scope. Then the engineers, of course, have to look at things like called viscoelasticity. So what they did was to take, as Paul Studley in this case, uh, take biofilms, so this is a tower coming up to us here and another, there are three towers in this picture, and put it under very, very high shear. So what they did was just crank up the pumps as high as they go. And what then happens is that the biofilm tower deforms and makes a tadpole-like thing called a streamer at the back here. And these start to oscillate back and forth like this. At some point, they break. And this mess here, containing a couple of hundred cells, just takes off in the direction of the flow. So biofilms aren't rigid. They aren't things like little crispy things sitting on a surface. They're rubbery. And they're rubbery, reacting to flow. If they break off at some point and then go downstream, then of course you get the biofilm transferred downstream a considerable distance. Taking this back into the medical area, we just got funded in this area. We're interested in infected heart valves because clinicians will tell you if you have an endocarditis or an infected mechanical valve, then you'll get downstream effects. You'll start to get little petechiae, they're called in the lung, where a bunch of bacteria comes and jams in a capillary bed and starts growing. You lose that part of your lung. You also tend to get stroke a lot because they'll break off and go up your carotids into your brain and hit the capillary beds there. And so uh, we then went back and looked at the uh, matrix strength in these uh, biofilm towers like this. And it turns out that if they're formed at low flow, then they're very, very breakable so that they are very soft and they come off really easily. If they're formed at high flow, they're real tough and rubbery. So the idea is, you know, why don't you clean something by just putting a pressure surge through and knock all the biofilm off? Well, if you could put a pressure surge through, the next ones that form are a bit more rubbery. Do another pressure surge, next ones are even more rubbery, and that finally get them, they're just like hard dental plaque, and they won't move with anything. So the bacteria can actually adapt the strength of the matrix that they're living in to the circumstances that they're living in. They live nice and soft if it's a low flow situation, real hard and rubbery if it's a high flow situation. What you've got in a pipe for potable water, this is a perfect example. We have a specialist in potable water and camper in the center. And we've been really intrigued with uh, delivering potable water to various things in hospitals and domestically. You have tremendous biofilms in any water distribution system. So if you ever have experience with water distribution systems, if you shock chlorinate a water distribution system, you can be in worlds of trouble. We actually have two people here from, from water filtration plants. Great. 
So basically, you can knock off a whole bunch of biofilm at a given point. You get a backhoe hitting a pipe. You can have all kinds of stuff coming off. And so it's the biofilm you're working with. What you do when you get a grab sample is you, you're actually sampling whatever it took off, was released in the last couple of seconds before you took the sample. So the biofilm will be there, a thousand times as many organisms in the biofilm as are actually in the catch samples that you're taking. So what we're doing right now in this system is looking at the German system of getting along without chlorine. And what we do here is put a reactor up front that takes almost all the nutrients out of the water. It's called a bioreactor. If it grows through, it becomes a bug factory, but if you keep changing it, to taking it offline and bleach cleaning it, you can in fact take almost all the nutrients out of the water, make biofilm on purpose, deal with it locally, and not have it come all the way down your pipe. So we then have a whole bunch less biofilm in the distribution system. I got your question. As you're coming down the system, you've got very much less biofilm. The question was, could pathogens still sequester themselves in this biofilm and come out later on and cause some kind of an outbreak? So we put all kinds of pathogens in, including Shigella and Salmonella and a great many things and coliforms, and looked at whether or not they would partition in and out of the thinner biofilm. And as you go lower and lower in nutrients, the pathogens are less comfortable in these biofilms. And we're, we're now really getting into it in a big way for bioterrorism. Because actually a bed up front with a whole bunch of biofilm and it binds all the viruses. So if viruses happen to hit, then you can actually isolate them as being all tangled up in the slime and the bacterial biofilm. And then if that one showed up as positive on a detector for a bad virus, you just hit the other. It could be particularly good. And biofilm on the side of a pipe will trap viruses into it, but biofilm crossing, bridging a whole bunch of sand particles filters the viruses out. So in fact, if you had a detector on four units, right, and you, uh, in that case, put them all into one unit and took it offline and it went, went to exhaust, you could actually probably protect the system from viruses if you had a good sensor to do it. So. It's getting quite cute in these systems now. The one that really intrigues me in the hospital is the ventilation systems. I mean, if you've got an air conditioning system and you've got condensate trays in there, and, and we've taken them apart in the hospital in Calgary, and they're... Well, I mean, I think when, you, when your car first stops, when you turn your car air conditioner on, a real strange smell comes out, right? Okay? It's anaerobes. I mean, it, it's stale anaerobic smell. So what's been happening, all, all winter you've had this uh, biofilm growing in your car air conditioner. Uh, it's produced some anaerobes, that's the only way you get anaerobes in a, a water system like that. You blow the stale smell off of the thing, but how many uh, particles do you blow off? And what we did in the, in the ventilation system in the hospital we were working on was to, we had uh, filters for catching. And with biofilm particles are your enemies. Single planktonic bacteria don't cause you that much problem in your lung, but a lump of biofilm is really bad, right? So in the case of just engineering, I mean, just put baffles in, didn't put park a patient right under a, a whole bunch of incoming bacteria. Because when we take animals, uh, five different species of animals with six different <laughs> pathogens, and I pre-make a biofilm lump and put it down in their lung and compare that with planktonic cells. Planktonic cells are clear in four hours because the phagocytes are working. But if I put down a biofilm lump, then I can still isolate a month later. Animal's not that sick. It's just cruising along with a biofilm colony in some part of the lung. And if it gets stressed, and we stress them with steroids, then the infection will pop out again. So I think we all see a certain number of uh, these kinds of pulmonary challenge. And uh, breathing in biofilm, aspirating biofilm lumps is a bad idea. Mike? Yeah. I'd like you don't mind, just go back a minute to the sure. distribution problem because uh -huh. I came from uh, Representative Dr. Murray McQuake, who said many of you know are involved in the Walkerton situation. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. And the build-up of biofilms in uh, distribution systems is a major concern. Sure. Now, uh, I appreciate what you said about the, the new concept being developed and being used in Germany, but uh -huh. what can you do about old systems in which biofilms have been have built up and, in fact, the Walkerton has ripped out nine kilometers of pipe they being replaced because the biofilm was literally cut down to flow by half. Because I had it by, by half. They run a pig down it to clean it out, and then they chlorinated it. One of the items I picked up from what you're saying is that 
you need to re pig it a second time after you've done the chlorine. We find the most effective thing is a double pig. But now the situation, Jake, you talked about you know, using chlorine is not necessarily a good thing, but what do you do in these older systems? It's very, very difficult, and Anne is, is uh, looking at total replacement in most of the systems she's in. She's so busy right now with people putting in new systems, and the question of whether copper pipe in houses is damaging, and a couple of questions like that, that she can't go back into the retrofit. So what, the only thing she's been able to do so far is take a real bad system, heavily overgrown with biofilms, put a reactor on the front end of it, because we actually have an experimental loop in our local water treatment plant, and so we can foul it and then put a biotreater in and then cut down the nutrients coming into the system. It gets on recycle. If anything dies in the biofilm, the neighbors simply use up, but it loses a little bit each time. And she's been finding very sad effects because if you have a well-established biofilm that's being well fed by the nutrients from some stream source or something, and you cut down the nutrients, you get a huge stuffing events. Like patches of it will die, patches of it will come off. So you actually get particulates and slime in it as you cut, start to cut the nutrients down, and the system goes right to hell. So if you start cutting the nutrients down. So the best thing you can have in your, in your water distribution system right now, in the absence of a bioreactor, is a healthy biofilm that's well fed and tight, and not letting too much go. And if you're on a well, never pull the casing on your well and look at it because uh, you've been drinking water that's been coming over a filthy looking mess with all kinds of oscillating slime fibers and so on. And the best bet so far, it's rather sad, is to keep your biofilm healthy, don't have it coming off, keep it well fed, don't antagonize it, don't hit it with any chlorine or anything. But it's a very ticklish situation when you're thinking about it. I mean, there's, a, there's something living down there and you've got to keep it happy or it will do bad things for you. So it's not a very satisfactory arrangement. Uh, the, the politics of, of, uh, of risk in the, in the U.S., I find it very, I won't get too far off topic, I swear. You can't take any risks in the U.S. It isn't set up for it. I mean, they'll put 14 helicopters in to take out one wounded soldier and kill 20 people. They do it all the time, right? They won't accept any risk at all. And getting the U.S. to actually take chlorine off will be the very last thing that will ever happen. So we're actually looking more at computer plants and that kind of thing with our bioreactors, because we've now engineered them and designed them. I don't think you'll ever get uh, safety-minded people to take chlorine off. But I think we can learn how to manage the system better. And you know, if we know there's a biofilm there, uh, one of the things we can do is put in biofilm samplers. So rather than taking a grab sample of the water and trying to figure out what's happening with the biofilms, we can put one of these Robbins device coupons in on a side stream or put into a mainstream and be able to actually look at the biofilm at a given point. So find out what's there, do PCR on it, find out what organisms are there, find out if there's any pathogens there and do those kinds of things. You'd never believe what we eventually ended up doing for the computer people and it really worked out very, very well. We took centered glass beads, <coughs> just a little tube about that long, about that long, and fairly narrow diameter and centered them so there's about a 40 micron track through them, an infinite track through them. And we relied on the bacteria making biofilms on those glass beads. And in one working shift, we just throw them away at the end of every shift. So we try to minimize the number of bacteria coming through. Then we trap them as a biofilm on these end-use filters and chuck them, working out 75 cents each. And that's the best protection you can find. So it's, it's kind of interesting. You just want to think two phases. OK, I got my water, any kind of water system. Here's my water. It's got a biofilm in it, and it's got planktonic cells in it. So rather than just measuring the planks, you measure both, understand both, and you can manipulate the system quite well. So that's been the most successful thing so far. And ozone has been a real problem for us because ozone, if we ozonate the water coming in, breaks up a whole bunch of nutrients that the bacteria otherwise couldn't have used, makes them available to the bacteria, and we get a biofilm bloom right after the ozonator, which in some cases we can use to our advantage, and sometimes we can't, so sometimes we ozonate and sometimes we don't. But sort of looking at both halves of the equation all the time could lead you to the right answer, I think. Was there another question back then? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you looked like you had two questions. Biofilms, is it better to have a constant flow? Because I know the dental offices overnight and the water lines is tremendous flow. Is it better to have a constant flow? 
better to just have a constant flow of will they grow in a, a swelling environment down the street? Yeah, that's a, that's a super good question, and we're working on. We, we got a grant uh, in the states on on dental water lines right now. You know, you're right, and I I hadn't thought about it. Um, letting it stew is going to let planktonics loose. Any chunks of biofilm that come off are loose. Turn it on in the morning, you're going to get a fairly good shower of things coming off, right? Keep it going at the same at the right shear rate all the time. Just keep it recirculating at the right shear rate all the time. It's going to then give you a steady release of bacteria and feces, but at a lower level. If you've got a Reynolds number of 2,400 or something, and that's really clapping along, right? Mm -hmm. And a perfectly smooth surface. You think that bacteria aren't going to make a biofilm on that surface when they're going by at that rate, and they actually are. They love it. Uh, if you look at one of these streams, right where a waterfall lands and there's tremendous shear forces, that's the very best biofilm you'll ever find. So they have solved the problem of how you jump onto a surface when you're going by about 60 miles an hour. So, but taking that uh, aside, the whole idea of putting pressure surges through and then going offline, or go putting pressure surges through and putting in a three micron filter that's gonna let planktonics through but catch the biofilm pieces is another question. And the thing we're doing now, the thing we got the grant for, it's really quite cute, is that if bacteria are living, they contain coenzymes called NAD. And if the NAD is there, and you irradiate with, IR, with infrared at 606, then all the coenzymes in the bacteria light up, and they refluoresce at 632 nanometers. So if you have this probe built into the line, and there's nothing there, it goes out at 606, never comes back, right? Your gauge stays at zero. If bacteria come on and you irradiate at 606, then they refluoresce at 632 and the gauge starts to show you fouling, okay? So then you hit it with a sterilant and then if you knock them off, like you would with a bleach sterilant, it goes down to zero. But if you kill them, like with glutaraldehyde and they're still there, the NAD, which is usually reduced, goes oxidized and refreshes at 618. So your 632 changes and your 618 comes up. So you can actually watch the biofilm form and also watch the biofilm kill with an online machine. Being developed by Intelligent Optical Systems in California, and I think it will come online pretty quick. So it is actually going to be able to tell you uh, by being built into the side of the wall of the pipe with a little optical path to a detector and if there's nothing there, no fluorescence. If they're alive, 632. If they're dead, 618. And you can start to actually see them on a gauge, which is great. Does that make sense? OK. So um, let's keep on going with the, some of the science that came out of this. This is, we have a full-time artist at the center, as you could probably tell. <laughs> Her name is Peg Derrix. And she's absolutely magic. And of course, we're all thinking single species biofilms so far, but um, in the water lines and that type of thing, there's no such thing. Oh, did I miss a question back there? Well, I just had a question uh -huh. that ultraviolet light effective against biofilms. <laughs> Much less so than planktonic cells. So UV light will actually uh, penetrate through a biofilm kind of poorly. Uh, a lot of it gets trapped in the matrix, and the cells are pretty resistant. And in sunlight, uh, you'll have biofilms forming on boulders, like in the Antarctic. They call it a varnish, a desert varnish. And the UV is not very effective against biofilm bacteria. Uh, it kills the first three or four at the top. It doesn't penetrate very well. So let's go back into the uh, um, <coughs> Oh, hey, that was the, next, that was the right next slide. <laughs> so we, we're getting involved in periodontitis, which is where you got biofilms in a deepening crevice between your tooth and your gum. And uh, this is one where we got one of the engineers uh, to look at this. We had it on the confocal scope, and the easy way to get it is just pull out somebody's tooth when it's going to come out anyway, and keep it nice and fresh and put it under the confocal scope. I mean, you can just see these towers coming straight back up at you like this. And it looked pretty solid when we were looking down from the top like this. So then we gave it to our dynamics guy, Paul Studley, and he just put it into a high flow system and just float it real hard. Now, in the periodontal space, it would never get flowed real hard, okay? 
But what happens is each one of these has an attachment point down here, and they all move independently. So it looks like a kelp bed in a storm. And you see them all going back and forth. So in fact, if a bunch of biofilm elements are like this and this, and you're stationary, and you're looking at them with no flow, they look like they're pretty tight, right? But when they start whipping around in a high flow situation, you realize that if they're disturbed in any way, those channels widen out, so the circulation's even better. So this is how you're getting your food down to the bottom, how you're getting rid of the waste and everything. The whole thing has got attachment points, long things coming out of the attachment points, and a great deal of mobility and how it actually operates. So, so this is the icon picture that Peg drew of the of biofilms with circulation across the bottoms and streamers out the back, sort of our trademark these days. Um, we wondered about the resistance of biofilms to uh, antibacterial agents. We thought, okay, what's happening is there's a matrix there, and obviously whatever it is, glutaraldehyde, tobramycin, or anything, is not making it down through the matrix. At least that's what I thought, uh, being non-mathematical about it. So I published that, that this is probably the case, that these things are being excluded by the matrix material. And all kinds of mathematically based people started writing papers I didn't understand with formulae about this long, uh, saying that, no, the matrix is so full of water that it's not a barrier to diffusion of any kind. And they turned out to be right. Uh, in fact, if we add uh, an antibiotic to the outside of a biofilm 300 microns thick, and then have a detection system at the bottom for when the antibiotic arrives. It takes 90 seconds for it to come from the outside right to the very bottom. Now that was when we thought the biofilm was a slab, a solid slab. So then we started look, calculating how long it took to get in the middle of a mushroom head. And it takes about 30 seconds. So the diffusion is very, very quick. If the diffusing molecule is non-reactive, if it's chlorine or something like that, then it's getting used up as it diffuses in and it goes, of course, slower. But basically, there's no real diffusion problem. So we uh, are left with the question of why are these organisms so very, very resistant to uh, antibiotics and, and biocides? And Dave Davies uh, developed a new technique. And I won't bother you with the technique and how it works, but basically, the cells are observed with a microscope. They come onto a surface like this. And they've been genetically modified so that when they turn on a gene, they change color. So on the promoter for the gene, whatever your promoter is, you put a little reactor there that makes them turn yellow, or in some cases, blue or green, when the gene turns on. Okay? Don't have to understand how it works particularly, but the cells light up when the gene comes on. So we were interested in the gene for slime production because these floating bacteria have slime on their surface left over from the previous incarnation, but they're not making slime. So this one lands, and at first it doesn't light up, but then it lights up, and so all of its neighbors light up, and they start making all kinds of slime here. So we saw that that gene was turned on, and we could justify this cartoon, which is uh, planktonic bacteria come down, settle, turn on probably, we thought, six or eight genes, and start making the slime fibers like this, and this is your biofilm. But the next slide was a bombshell, and it's only two and a half years old. Uh, this is, uh, these are planktonic bacteria grown in various media. There are planktonic bacteria grown in an iron deficient medium. And what we're looking at here is the proteins in their cell walls and membranes. You can see this banding pattern, a large number of proteins formed by these organisms. That would make up their wall and their membrane. This is the planktonic population, and this is the corresponding biofilm population of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And none of those proteins are the same. I mean, we do densitometer traces, and there isn't a single protein that's the same between the planktonic and the biofilm. And we just couldn't believe it. So we thought we had contamination and all kinds of, well, it must be a different species of bacteria or something. And then we went back and nailed it. And there's now a PhD thesis that Hong Wei Yu has his PhD thesis on this. And this is the discovery, basically, that there's a biofilm phenotype. That is, of course, all bacteria have the same genes in their DNA. But they express different ones in different situations. And the biofilm phenotype, which is the gene expression in the biofilm, is so different from the planktonic cells 
is more different than a spore is from a vegetative cell, if you can imagine. It takes 65 genes to make a spore happen, and there's 85 when they actually go into a biofilm that have changed. Some shut off, some shut on. And so the uh, take-home message on this one is that there's a fantastic genetic change, phenotypic expression change, when bacteria go onto a surface. They actually become just about like a different organism. Proteins in their walls change, proteins in their membranes change, and they're spectacularly resistant. Now you're going to think of this, particularly since everybody's thinking this morning, okay? what, what experiment would you do when you the week after you found this out. Come on, guys. Take a biofilm and do what? Mechanically stir it up. Okay. Break, yeah, there we go. Break it all up, okay? <laughs> and do it so fast that you got suspended biofilm cells, right? So they got the biofilm phenotype, even though they're floating totally resistant, and then gradually change over into the planktonic phenotype and become sensitive again. So it isn't the matrix, and it isn't being all stacked on top of each other. It's a totally different phenotype. So when, when we do this, we have planktonic cells coming down, and here they, they're growing as fast as they can grow. They're dividing, in this case, every 18 minutes, growing real high. This is the amount of messenger RNA they're making, and then this is the amount that they make when they go onto the surface. So they turn on a whole bunch of new genes. And maybe penicillin's not going to work because there isn't any penicillin binding protein anymore. You know, it's just totally different. And streptomycin might not work because the ribosomes are all different. As long as you've got a targeted thing like an antibiotic, you have a totally different critter on there. So I'm thinking now we could probably start developing antibiotics against biofilm bugs because they're just a different thing. You know, we could. It does, doesn't it? Eh? And, and, and for a long, long time, we just couldn't do it in terms of diffusion resistance. We thought there had to be a diffusion resistance. Totally wrong. It's just a different phenotype. It takes 10 to the 8th before it starts feeling slimy on the surface. 10 to the 5th won't feel slimy at all. And the deal is you just take those surfaces, and uh, we use now a fish probe, which is you can identify species with these probes. So they turn green if, there's, if they're staph aureus, and they don't turn green if they're staph epi, for example. VRE would be a classic case. Make yourself a probe against VRE. Go onto the surface with a confocal scope. Take the surface off and put it under the scope. And then just see if you've got living versus dead. And if you've got living versus dead, do whatever cleaning you're going to do. And make sure they're A, dead, and B, removed. And then uh, control the whole thing by direct observation. This is what the engineers have done for us. I mean, we don't trust the old microbiological methods anymore. Just think about swabbing, eh? <laughs> I mean, you come along with this cotton ball and you rub it back and forth, okay? Well, you might pick up a uh, microcolony of bacteria, you might not, okay? And then the microcolony of bacteria wrapped around this cotton fiber might let go as you went across the agar plate, or it might not, okay? But if it does let go and it contains a million bacteria, one colony. Go figure. So I mean, I mean you just, it's not going to, you're not going to get the right number. <laughs> no, <laughs> we can share. <laughs> so so the, the, the biggest thing about the biofilm concept is that you, it, it, it doesn't do real well with the traditional microbiological methods, the scrape and plate methods, because they're, they're okay for growing planktonic cells, but really, you, uh, and you really got to watch Engineers have these funny little vertical lines between their, their, their eyebrows like this, and the, you explain to them how you count bacteria, and these lines intensify and intensify, and finally the guy looks disfigured, you know? <laughs> disfigured, sorry. All kinds of uh, vertical lines, 20 vertical lines across between his eyebrows while he's trying to figure out what the heck you're talking about. I mean, microbiologists have done these incantations and mutterings for a very long length of time. I'm trained this way, right? You go to a $1.5 billion desalination plant in Saudi Arabia and everything's green blinking lights and immediate readout and they bought the plant from Germany and everything's absolutely modern and perfect. And there's a little Yemeni guy going along with test tubes and a white coat on. He's the microbiologist. All the data on the whole plant is instantaneous except the microbiology. It all involves one little guy in a white coat doing mysterious things. 
So we've got to stop doing mysterious things because <laughs> we actually usually got it wrong. So um, this is the, the phenotype as it comes up like this. And so uh, Eleanor Pulcini, who is our hero right now, she's a second year graduate student and she gave a one hour talk to a very major meeting recently. And she's kind of arrived. Uh, she's doing the uh, protein analysis of the planktonic phenotype as opposed to the, back to the biofilm phenotype very systematically. And on Pseudomonas, she's up to 84 genes, some turned off and some turned on. Now, of course, each of these spots that is, comes up in the biofilm and not the plankton, you have to trust her because these things have got about 400 spots on them. <laughs> she can now cut these out and start doing an in-terminal analysis and find out what protein they are, and this gene is turned on and this gene is turned off. And this will be a couple of decades before we finally figure out exactly which things are turned off and which things are turned on but it's spectacular. This, this just sold itself uh, in July because we had a girl with a delightful name, Fitnat Yildiz. She's a uh, Turkish uh, postdoc in California at Stanford. She picked up this idea and they do uh, arrays. Uh, these are DNA expression arrays. And she made a gene expression array for Vibrio cholera. And she ran the planktonic versus the biofilm. And now all kinds of people are doing them. They're, none of them are published yet. They're just sort of in the process of being done. And Vibrio cholerae is running up to, th to 62, 63 genes changing. Pseudomos ruginosa is running at the er low 80s. Uh, Putid is running in the low 80s. And uh, one gram positive people have looked at so far is running at least in the low 60s. I wonder if that might be a possible explanation as to there are situations that have arisen where you have a very high coal or a coal I count yeah. detection in a system uh -huh. and a very high chlorine residual. Yeah. And in fact, you might be dealing with this resistant bi this biofilm phenotype. You could be really working, but uh, you could be really working with a biofilm phenotype that's very resistant. The only sterilant, however, that I that think doesn't pay any attention to what proteins are there on is chlorine. So I think what you've got is a biofilm, all right, and you're not getting to the bottom of it because of the you know it being used up in the penetration. Your residual is okay, but you're not getting the chlorine in. But most things like tobramycin and penicillin and so on, and even some of the sterilants, are fairly protein specific. But I don't think chlorine cares what exact protein pattern you got on there. It's going to come down, digest the matrix, and kill the cells anyway. So yes, I would agree with the first half of it, but not necessarily with the second half of it. So uh, this whole business of the chlorine residual is I think is, is, is really pretty simple now, isn't it? Because you've got water going along the pipe, chlorine's being used up by the biofilms on the wall of the pipe, but you get a certain amount to the end and you measure it as a chlorine residual, okay? That doesn't mean you penetrated down through the layers at all. And so this is why I like uh, Zbigniew Lewandowski's chlorine probe, because he can stick it in on the wall of the pipe under a biofilm and say, yeah, the chlorine got there, or no, the chlorine didn't get there. So we use it when we do a soak as we shut off an area, really slug it with the chlorine. And then when the big news probes take off and light up and say, you know, chlorine arrived, you got there. You're right down to the surfaces. Forgot the next slide. Now, um, just try to summarize the points that we made, okay? You've got a system. You know, it doesn't matter what the system. It could be a cleaner. Let's go back to Marcus's cleaner, okay? Pretty high organic load, right? Okay. Uh, you got water in there. Water is going by at a certain rate, okay? You're going to get preferential biofilm formation on anything that's been in that position for a long time, like your washer. In other words, like your fish tank, you're going to get a thousand fold more bacteria on the wall. I don't think there's time in a colonoscope, it's not in p enough in the procedure to actually develop much of a biofilm itself. I mean, it's only being used for a matter of 20 or 30 minutes. That's not very long for a biofilm to develop. Okay, what are you going to do? You're going to clean off, mechanically clean off those surfaces, so probably you're okay. Uh, your sterile is going to get down to the surfaces. You, being clean is as important as being sterile in those cases, okay. But what about the tank? And what about the case where you keep your contact lenses overnight? The best biofilm I've ever seen in my whole life. <laughs> no, second best biofilm I've ever seen in my whole life is in contact lens storage cases. Uh, wonderful thing. You, the lens is perfectly clean when you take it out of your eye and you chuck it into the storage case. And I think that's why these uh, 
continuous wear lenses do as well as they do. <laughs> they don't see storage cases. So, so basically, you get stale water. And the stale water is going to develop on the surfaces. Okay. Now, your great uh, two weapons that you have are mechanical cleaning and oxidizing biocides. Take it right back to clean. After you've cleaned it and there's any bacteria left and you never can completely sterilize the system, in four hours you've got a pretty good biofilm, in 12 hours you've got a real good biofilm, in four days you've got a mature biofilm. Okay? So that's how fast the thing is going to happen. Okay, if bacteria coming off for your problem, like floating off the biofilm and contaminating something, then a planktonic killing dose is okay because the biofilm's there, perfectly happy by itself. Anything that comes off is getting killed. So anything that doesn't touch the biofilm and get a smear on it would be okay. But if you took that scope and rubbed it past the biofilm wall, it touched the wall, you're going to actually have a smear of living bacteria in their own slime. And that's going to heavily contaminate whatever you're doing. And now I don't want to take that particular issue, but now, it's, now dry that out and take a different thing in a hospital like an air conditioning system. Start blowing air past it real hard like this. Start to mobilize pieces of the biofilm off and get them suspended in the room air. Aspirate them and you have a dangerous <laughs> situation. So I think it's you have to be realistic about it, but I think probably my point, uh, I'm not used to stopping at this particular time in the presentation, but my point so far is look at both populations. I mean, we just traditionally look at the planktonic population, and if we look at both populations, I think we'll understand better. I was with a company yesterday that has had contamination problems, and they were just driving them crazy because they'd take a sample one minute and they get a count of a certain amount, take a sample the next minute, and it was sterile. Then they took the same sample and ran it through two different filters from the same jug. And one filter was heavily contaminated and the other one was nothing on it. And it was driving them absolutely round the bend. But what's the explanation? You got biofilm fragments. And in one case, you went through one filter from the top and then they were all settling out. Next time you stir it up the bottom and they all went to the other filter. And the big thing is just inconsistencies. And in all water systems, you have massive inconsistencies. You take a sample one minute, you got one count, another minute you got the other count. And what does the count mean in the first place? Well, the count doesn't mean a whole bunch. If a biofilm fragment with a million cells grew up as a single colony, then it doesn't really represent the right numbers. So what we're going to develop is a whole new suite of methods. And my next section does actually start a 